Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to the Crossroads Institute. And uh, we're excited that you're with us for our study tonight through the book of Romans, so rich in gospel theology. So I hope that you're ready to, to listen well, take good notes. Um, I'm excited to introduce to you one of our elders, R.W. Mackey, who will be leading us through our study of Romans tonight. Well, hello everyone from uh, Crossroads that's uh, participating in the Bible Institute. It's uh, great to have you join me this evening, and I hope your uh, studies are going well. Um, I hope that you're understanding more of the Word, and I hope you're able, through the power of the Spirit, uh, not only to understand it, but, uh, you know, to live it out as well. Of course, that's uh, where the blessing of God comes from, according to Jesus. He said, blessed are you if you know these things and do them. And so that's uh, the goal of the whole thing is not just to know it, but to, to live it out um, in the knowing. So I'm R.W. Mackey, and uh, I serve uh, as an elder here at the church. And I was delighted that uh, they asked me to participate in this. But I've got to, to confess a little bit intimidated by it. Uh, as, uh, you know, I was asked to do the Book of Romans. Uh, so here we go. We're going to spend... Uh, you know, an hour-ish in Romans, and uh, I'm aware of the fact that uh, commentators uh, on this uh, book have written volumes and volumes. Uh, expository uh, preachers have spent years uh, preaching and teaching it, and so our task this evening is to uh, get through this in, in an hour. Uh, maybe they thought, well, it's R.W. after... Uh, he tells them everything he knows. There'll still be 45 minutes left, and they'll get out early. I don't know, but nevertheless, uh, I'm looking forward uh, to some time with you. And I do want to just stop and ask the Lord's blessing on our time as we begin. Father, we uh, thank you that we're a part of uh, the fellowship here at Crossroads, and we thank you that uh, you're using the church to equip us for what you would have us to do in the, in the days ahead. And I pray that this study in Romans will just be part of that equipping so that we can all do the work of the ministry uh, here in our church or wherever we find ourselves. As we uh, look at this uh, wonderful gem that uh, has been placed in your word, I pray that our hearts through the power of your spirit will come alive, both in terms of understanding it a little better and even more importantly, to applying it um, in the days ahead. So we give our time to you, and we do this in your son's precious name. Amen. Now, as we begin to think about uh, the book of Romans, I guess uh, we should probably start uh, with the background uh, for the book. And, uh, you know, it's a little wonder that we say, well, Romans was uh, written by Paul because the very first word in the book is Paul. And uh, he identifies himself as an author and then uh, talks about himself as a bondservant of Jesus Christ, uh, called to be a, an apostle, set apart for the gospel. And uh, so it, it's Pauline uh, in its uh, authorship and oftentimes referred to, you know, as a Pauline epistle or a, as a letter from the apostle Paul. Now, it was probably uh, written in Corinth. Uh, he stayed in uh, Corinth, uh, as recorded for us in Acts chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 3. And uh, most believe it was written uh, during that time. And uh, Paul was with uh, Gaius. He was with uh, Erastus there. And in uh, Romans chapter uh, 16, verse 23, uh, these two were mentioned as being with Paul uh, in Corinth. And uh, also, if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 14, and 2 Timothy 2, uh, 4, uh, uh, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 20, uh, we see these individuals as highlighted as uh, being with the Apostle Paul and uh, you know, and so that association with them in uh, Corinth and uh, the fact that it's uh, indicated that uh, 
that they were involved with uh, Rome makes us think that probably there's that connection between Corinth and Rome, and it was written uh, during that time. Uh, there's a good chance that the letter was de delivered by uh, Phoebe, um, who's uh, mentioned in Romans 16 and verse 1. And uh, she lived in a seaport city the, close by Corinth. And so it may have been that when Paul in uh, Romans chapter 16 recommends her to the believers in Rome, that uh, he does so because she's visiting and even delivering the letter uh, that he's written uh, to them. Uh, Paul's friends, uh, Quilla and Priscilla, were originally from Rome, um, and uh, they're mentioned in Acts chapter 18 and verse 2, and Paul greets them in Romans uh, chapter 16 and verse 3, so uh, they must have found their way back to, to Rome again um, as well. So uh, Paul had a lot of connections with uh, the folks in Rome, and uh, and the connection seemed to be, you know, between Corinth and uh, Rome. Now, the audience uh, for the letter is um, kind of interesting. Uh, many times when Paul uh, writes, he writes to the church in, and you fill in the blank. Not so with the book of Romans. In uh, verse 7 of chapter 1, he says, To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. So we don't have the mention of a church uh, here in Rome. And uh, so it was probably a, a group of believers. The church may have been fairly large at this time. It might have been dispersed, maybe a little bit uh, like the church in, um, uh, that's mentioned in Acts that was, uh, began in Jerusalem, where you have a large church, but then you have smaller uh, house churches or cells that meet in different places. Uh, it, it could very well uh, have been like that uh, in Rome. And, uh, you know, in chapter 16, where Paul is giving his greetings to many of the believers that were in Rome, uh, you know, there's quite a, uh, quite a large cadre of, of believers and probably were meeting in different locations and, and uh, in different ways, uh, such that uh, he just didn't identify the church uh, in Rome. It's uh, instead to, to all the believers that were found there. Now, uh, you can't uh, talk about Rome and the, the church in Rome uh, without, uh, of course, mentioning uh, Peter. Uh, many believe that uh, Peter started the church in Rome. They, they believe that he lived there for oh, probably 25 years or so. Uh, and uh, so he's seen as the, the beginning of the, that church. And, of course, uh, the Catholic Church would, would hold to that tradition, and they do so because uh, Jesus uh, told uh, Peter, he says, upon this rock I will build my church, and um, they believe then that the church was founded on uh, the Apostle Peter and, of course, the, uh, the Holy Roman Church, uh, as it was called, was... Uh, the church founded uh, upon the rock, upon Peter, and so they associate uh, Peter with that. Now, uh, it, it's a theory, and uh, the, the thing of it is, is that there's really no scriptural support for that theory. Uh, you don't have any passages of scripture that, uh, that identify Peter uh, with Rome or in Rome or the church in Rome. And there's no uh, historical evidence that supports that either. It would pretty much just be bound up in Roman Catholic Church tradition. Now, if, uh, if it were true that uh, Peter was in Rome and the church uh, was being built by Peter, uh, we would expect uh, for a church to exist, a, a more formal church, and we would expect the Book of Romans to be addressed specifically to that church, and it isn't. Uh, you would also expect uh, Paul to address Peter. He certainly did in other epistles in the New Testament and uh, recognized Peter's ministry, knew Peter was present in places, and so on and so forth. And, and he, does, uh, uh, he, he, he does address uh, uh, Peter, but not in any of the quote-unquote prison epistles. And these are... Um, 
not only the letter here that's written to Rome, but the prison epistles would be the letters that were written from uh, Rome. Uh, probably the most, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess the most outstanding, not outstanding, that's the wrong word, but probably the most uh, obvious one would be Philippians, uh, written as a prison epistle, but others as well. And, and they just don't mention Peter. And, and you probably expect that at least one of them would, or maybe even all of them, since uh, Peter's ministry was so significant. Uh, it's, it's also uh, uh, noteworthy that in uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 20, uh, Paul states there that he did not build on another man's foundation. Um, and... Uh, so in, in talking about Rome and the things that were going on in Rome, I think that if uh, Peter had been present or even another apostle or someone who had a significant uh, part in their ministry, that uh, Paul wouldn't say, I didn't build on another man's foundation. Instead, uh, he would you know, have said that um, you know, basically he was building on a foundation that God had laid through Peter or, you know, fill in the blank, whoever that might be. But again, he, he didn't mention that. Uh, also, uh, uh, Paul was very anxious uh, to uh, be involved in Rome and to, uh, to minister there. Uh, eventually, he does find his way there, and he didn't have to pay for the trip. Rome paid for it um, since Paul was taken there as a prisoner. Uh, but nevertheless, um, if Peter was there, if another apostle was there, if the church was going strong under uh, the leadership of those uh, individuals or an individual, then uh, Paul probably wouldn't have uh, expressed his anxiousness or his the fact that he was really looking forward to being there. That uh, you know, just sensed the need uh, that he been uh, that he be present among them. And he, he expressed that anxiousness in, in a variety of places. Uh, we see it in uh, the book of Romans in uh, chapter 1 and verse 13, uh, where he says, uh, And I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have prevented uh, from doing so thus far. In chapter 15, he mentions it several times in verses 15 through 29. And he also alludes uh, to it um, as uh, his uh, ideas and, and desires are recorded for us in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9, verse 21, chapter 23, verse 11. Uh, Paul was anxious to get there. And uh, I think he believed that, you know, this was his opportunity to uh, really firsthand uh, continue the work that uh, had been established through his ministry uh, the gospel probably then uh, got to Rome uh, as a result of what occurred in Pentecost. Uh, what happened in Pentecost is recorded for us in uh, Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 10, um, <clears throat> we read that uh, 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 Phrygia... Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of uh, Libya around Cyrene. And then in verse uh, 10 of Acts 2, it says, And visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytites, when it's listing the people that were present uh, and were converted uh, there uh, in Pentecost, at Pentecost when uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and, and uh, Peter was preaching, and uh, these thousands were converted, and some of those thousands were from Rome, and there's uh, probably every uh, chance that uh, they went back to where they were from, and, and they shared the good news uh, with the people that were in Rome, and as a result of that, um, the church began to... Uh, to grow in Rome and flourish, and, and Paul wanted to get uh, uh, back with them. Of course, we know Paul's heart uh, when we look at uh, the, the letters to the Thessalonians. Uh, we see that, uh, you know, he, he, his heart just beat. He, he said like a nursing mother, he desired to be with them and, and take care of them. And 
No doubt he felt that way about the Roman believers as well. Uh, now, all of those who are greeted by Paul in chapter 16 uh, are Gentiles. And uh, so that tells us that uh, the Roman church uh, was probably comprised uh, mostly of Gentile uh, believers. And, uh, and we see that, uh, you know, just in a, in a variety of places. But I'm sure that uh, there were uh, several Jewish people uh, that had found their way to Rome at this time as well. And so there were Jewish believers in the church. Uh, and that would probably occasion then when uh, Paul is talking about uh, God's relationship to Israel, that it would mean something to those uh, not only who are Gentiles, but uh, was an encouragement uh, to Jewish believers as well. Now, Rome, of course, was uh, kind of the center of the, the ancient world at that time. It was the greatest city in the world in that day. And uh, thousands of pilgrims made their way over Roman roads uh, to that city every year. And so no doubt, uh, many of them had been converted uh, to true faith. They were Christ followers. And uh, so they added to the evangelism of the city and then also uh, added to the spiritual life of, of those who were present in the city. There were probably a lot of reasons that uh, Paul wrote uh, uh, the book of Romans. Uh, one of the things that he wanted to do, of course, was to prepare them for his visit. Uh, probably you know, on at least uh, three occasions uh, in a big way and then in smaller ways within those occasions, uh, he reminded them that he was coming to, them to see them and he wanted them to be ready for when he came. We see that in chapter 1, verses 8 to 15 and chapter 15, uh, verses 23 to 29. I, I think probably, you know, as, as I read the book of Romans, and uh, as you've read it and continue to study it as well, uh, you've just got to believe that uh, maybe the primary purpose for the book is to ground those believers in sound doctrine. Uh, this book, uh, if you just had one book uh, to establish your doctrine, your beliefs on, which you know is a hypothetical question that doesn't deserve an answer, but on the other hand, if you just had one book, this would be it. You you would want the book of Romans as, uh, as your handbook for, uh, for so many different things, as we'll see. Um, this book, too, is going to explain the relationship of Israel and the church. Uh, no doubt, uh, you know, there was some confusion as uh, people found themselves in transition. Coming up to the cross, uh, God had uh, worked through the nation of Israel. Those had been his chosen people. Uh, they were that small group of people, you know, in, in the middle of the, the Middle East. And, uh, and they were the ones that, uh, that God had chosen uh, for, his, for his name and for his work. And now in Acts chapter 2, uh, through uh, Pentecost, what occurred at uh, Pentecost, the church is established. And so this, uh, uh, many uh, theologians, when they talk about God's work over the ages, they, they call it a, a dispensational uh, work. And so there are different dispensations or different times. And in those times, God uh, does uh, things differently. And so it seems uh, as though God is now doing something different. Uh, and that is, there's a shift uh, from Israel to the church. Uh, I guess the continuity of that would be what we call the people of God. There's always been a people of God. But now that people of God uh, begins to take on a, a different look. And of course, uh, the hallmark of uh, the church is that uh, when Jesus talked about the net being cast and and everything, every uh, all the, the the fish being drawn in, it's a big net, and so the church has people from every tribe and every tongue and and every uh, group possible 
uh, that are a part of it. And uh, this represented a tremendous adjustment, uh, I'm sure primarily on the part of uh, Jewish people who had seen, you know, God's work uh, primarily directed toward them, and, and now they see a much broader scope. And Paul will, uh, will be touching, not just touching on that, but going in depth. And, and when he does, uh, it'll really involve one of the great uh, uh, passages of Scripture relating to the sovereignty of God. Uh, a fourth reason could be to teach uh, believers their relationship to each other and to government. And so the book is going to begin to shift gears as we get about uh, three-fourths of the way through it, and uh, the teaching becomes uh, relational, uh, the relationship of the believer to government. Uh, what could be more germane than the day in which we live than that? And then uh, to each other, how believers are to respond to each other uh, within the body of Christ. Uh, as always, Paul's ministry was uh, uh, I don't, was the object of criticism. It was the object of slander, of ridicule. Uh, that's probably one way uh, uh, people know that they're effective for Christ is that Satan won't let them alone. And uh, Paul, of course, was very effective in uh, God using him to establish the church in, um, in the known world at that time. And so a, a fair amount of the book will... Uh, be a refutation of the slander that's leveled against Paul. Uh, in chapter 3 and verse 8, that, that sort of comes to a, a bit of a head. Now, when you think about the place of Romans in Scripture, uh, there are probably uh, three books uh, in the New Testament that revolve around one Old Testament passage. And uh, that Old Testament passage is Habakkuk uh, 2.4, and uh, in Habakkuk 2.4, it says, The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And so uh, Romans is uh, no doubt the premier book in the New Testament uh, to take that uh, statement by Habakkuk and run with it. And that is uh, righteous people, li their lives will be characterized by faith. Uh, faith, of course, is... Uh, not only a belief in God, but it's obeying God and leaving the results up to God. And we'll see that in the book. And, and uh, one thing, too, when you think about this, uh, the just living by faith, then the result of living by faith will be living a spirit-filled life or a spirit-controlled life. And that will be contrasted in the book of Romans as it's contrasted in, in uh, all of Paul's writings, the conflict between the flesh and the spirit. So the flesh is basically anything that is done uh, through Adam and through the old man. It's anything that is uh, trying to accomplish something in this life through our own way and our own time. And the spirit just simply uh, means, and this is, this is how I define it, uh, the spirit would mean that instead of doing things in my way in my time, um, I, I trust the goodness and the wisdom of God. Um, and, and then uh, in so doing, uh, then live out uh, the, this, or allow the Holy Spirit to live through me. Now, some believe that uh, Paul's letters uh, follow an order that's found in 2 Timothy uh, 3.16, and that is some of Paul's letters would follow this order, and that is uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, first of all, for doctrine. And so when you want to find doctrine, uh, you look at the book of Romans, it's profitable for reproof, and uh, First and Second uh, Corinthians are uh, strong on reproof in terms of problems that had uh, sprung up in the church, and uh, problems that you know remain with the church to this day. Uh, profitable for doctrine, reproof for correction, and uh, the Book of Galatians is strong on doctrinal correction. 
and setting, uh, you know, setting the sail right uh, for doctrine, especially as it relates to works versus faith. And then lastly is instruction in righteousness. And uh, the book of Ephesians um, gives us this instruction in righteousness as it lays a strong theological foundation and then follows that uh, with so many things that uh, revolve, first of all, around just being filled or controlled uh, by the Holy Spirit. This, uh, the importance of the book of Romans, of course, can't, uh, can't be overstated. Um, while all scripture is given by God, this book contains more doctrinal truth than many other parts of the Bible. What could be of more importance than a correct understanding of our situation and God's remedy? Eternity is in the balance within the truths found in this book. St. Augustine was converted reading Romans. Martin Luther's salvation and his subsequent role in launching the Reformation began in the book of Romans as well. John Wesley was converted uh, listening to someone read from Luther's commentary on Romans. And so many uh, individuals uh, owe their conversion to God speaking to them through what's called the Romans Road. And uh, I suppose that you've heard of the Romans Road. If not, uh, maybe, you know, at another time uh, we could talk a little bit about that. But uh, if, I, if I'm explaining to someone you know, how they can have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I take them to the book of Romans and establish, first of all, their need for salvation, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And uh, then talk about the wages of that sin, which is death, but the gift of God's salvation is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then talk about how that um, as Paul said, if we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and we confess with our, our mouth that, that Jesus is Lord, that uh, we can be saved. And uh, so that Romans road is uh, just a clear path for a, a person to find a refuge in God, both now and for eternity. And so I suppose if, as I mentioned earlier, if there's just one book that every believer uh, should get a handle on and understand, um, it's the book of Romans. Now, I like the way that uh, James Montgomery voice, voice uh, lays out a, a brief overview of Romans. And uh, so hopefully you can kind of uh, pick this up with me uh, just a little bit. But uh, uh, when he's... Uh, talking about uh, the book of Romans just generally, uh, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 15, uh, he offers uh, an introduction uh, to the book. And then in, in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, we see the theme of the book. And the theme of the book, you know, he begins by uh, saying that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. And then in verse 17, of course, he refers back to uh, the prophet Habakkuk and says, you know, the just shall live by faith. And uh, if there is such a thing as a, as a one-word centerpiece for the book of Romans, it would be uh, Romans 1.17, and that is the just shall live by faith. And of course, uh, that was the verse that God used to speak to Martin Luther's heart and uh, resulted in uh, Luther's uh, uh, conversion. Uh, Paul then goes on to develop uh, human depravity and the divine provision for that depravity. And that begins in chapter 1, verse 18, and goes through chapter 4 and verse 25. And we'll expand on, on this uh, in a couple of minutes, but uh, uh, he launches from human depravity and divine provision into the scope of our salvation, or the scope of salvation. In chapter 5 and verse 1, uh, that begins, and, and it goes through uh, chapter 15 and, and verse 13, 
where he talks not only about the, the salvation that's provided, but the, the uh, inward struggle that results and, and then God's provision for the spirit of the spirit and, and, um, and the, the provision that the spirit offers us. And, and then uh, moves into uh, uh, talking about our, our response to all that in terms of uh, giving ourselves fully and completely to God. And uh, then just the, 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 the practical outworkings of that, as we mentioned earlier, both uh, with the government and especially our relationship to each other. And then he ends with his plans for the future that he desired to be with them and then also offers greetings you know, to several of the believers uh, that are in Rome. This takes us then uh, to an outline uh, of the book. And so now we'll, we'll look just a little more specifically. And uh, the outline is probably going to be a little easier uh, for you to follow and, and uh, plug into. And I adapted this outline from uh, some notes that uh, were published uh, several years ago. Uh, from Warren Wearsby, I, I thought the outline just made a lot of sense, and I really enjoy Wearsby. Uh, uh, extremely practical in his approach. He seems to uh, synthesize so well the truth of God's word with the meaning for us as just everyday uh, believers. And so, in chapter one, verses one to seventeen, is uh, the introduction. And it starts out with uh, Paul's salutation uh, to them, his greeting to them, and then moves into an explanation of uh, his writing, what occasioned his writing. And of course, it uh, is summed up, as we mentioned before, in, in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1, where he really gives us the punchline uh, of sharing the gospel and, and the fact that the just shall live by faith. The next uh, major section of the book, which runs from uh, chapter 1 and, and verse 18 uh, to uh, uh, chapter 3 and verse 20, is uh, the fact that uh, sin is present in the world. And uh, he builds his case here for the fact that, that uh, all have sinned and all find themselves as sinners uh, and because we're sinners, uh, we fall short of God's glory. Um, one way to think of it uh, would be the fact that uh, God is absolutely perfect. He's, he's, he's absolutely holy. Uh, if there were such a thing as one attribute that serves as an umbrella for all the other attributes, it would be the holiness of God, his absolute righteousness. And so some people talk about, you know, well, you know, maybe he sinned a lot or she sinned a little bit. Um, but with God, uh, once you offend uh, absolute perfection, then that's it. I mean, you're a sinner at that point. And Paul establishes the fact that we're sinners both by nature because we inherited this uh, sin from, our, from Adam and, uh, and we're sinners by deed as well. So we not only are born into sin, but we practice sin. And that's, uh, that's the double whammy that absolutely proves uh, that we're sinners. So we don't measure ourselves uh, by how we do compared to other people. Uh, we don't measure ourselves by how we think we're doing on our own. Instead, we're all measured uh, to the absolute uh, holiness and perfection of God. And therefore, all fall short of God's glory, as he says in, uh, in Romans. And so in chapter 1, verses 18 through 33, he talks about the Gentiles under sin. And uh, that description of the Gentiles, uh, you know, sounds like a description of the day and age we live in, that's for sure. And then in chapter 2, uh, one, uh, verse 1 through chapter 3 and verse 8, uh, he talks about the condition of Jewish people and how they find themselves uh, mired in sin. And then just a, a summary passage in chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, 
uh, where the whole world is under sin, for all have sinned and uh, come short of God's glory. But the cool thing, you know, and, and when you think about the flow of Romans, you think about the sweep of human history, <clears throat> you know, God could have just left everybody in their sin. He could have said, you know, that you guys just created your own crock pot, now just stew in your own juices for a while. Just see where this gets you, both now and for eternity. But that wasn't the case. Uh, the next part of the book is just a glorious, glorious part. In chapter 3, verse 31 through chapter 5, verse 21, um, salvation is discussed. Uh, salvation. And in this passage, then, uh, the first, uh, for the remainder of chapter 3, uh, he, he explains justification. Uh, what does it mean, you know, to be justified before God, to be uh, legally declared uh, righteous uh, before him? And uh, I think probably I agree with the theologian that says, if there's any... If there is such a thing as a two-word description in Scripture for what it means to, uh, to be a believer, it's the words, in Christ. Uh, when we find ourselves in Christ, uh, God doesn't see us as sinners. Instead, he sees us clothed with the righteousness of Christ. He sees us in the Beloved as Paul will say in uh, Ephesians chapter 1. He sees us uh, as, 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 Je as he sees Jesus. And, of course, Jesus was uh, one that was without sin. He was the perfect and uh, blameless and sinless uh, Lamb of God. And so this justification then means that we don't identify with the old Adam or the old man, as Paul describes him in Romans, instead we identify with the new man or the second Adam. And that Adam uh, got it right. The first Adam blew it. The first Adam yielded to temptation. Uh, the second Adam was tempted in all points, just as you and I are tempted, but uh, without sin. He never sinned. And so when he, when he went to the cross and uh, he bore our sins there, he was the perfect sacrifice. He was the Passover lamb. And, uh, uh, and the covering of, uh, of his blood uh, for us there on the cross, as we appropriate that through faith in him and we declare him as our Lord and Savior, uh, in our heart through the power of his spirit, then we are justified before God. And uh, he talks about Abraham in chapter 4, verses 1 through 25, and the justification there is expressed uh, in Abraham. And then, uh, and then in chapter 5 of Romans, the justification is experienced. It becomes ours um, through faith in, in Christ. And we'll look at some of these pivotal verses as, as we have time. Um, the passage, or excuse me, the book then moves to sanctification, and that's chapter 6 through 8. And here the righteousness then is imparted um, on just a, a daily basis. Um, and that justification uh, first of all, involves uh, us having a new position in Christ. And that new position in Christ uh, is signified, it's uh, symbolized uh, through baptism. And baptism, of course, is a picture of being dead to our, our old self and being alive to Christ, uh, dying to the flesh and being raised in newness of life, which is the spirit. And so three words that uh, really uh, come, come to the forefront in this passage. First of all, the word no, and no means that these are truths that we can know. These are truths that uh, we need to get a handle on. But the second word, which 
I don't think is, is preached or, or considered enough uh, by many believers is the word reckon. Uh, and, and that is uh, appropriate this, reckon it to be so. Um, in your heart of hearts, uh, say that, you know, I, I am a new creation in Christ and, and sin doesn't need to have dominion over me any longer. And uh, so reckon these things to be so and then uh, yield to the power of the Holy Spirit and uh, begin to live the, a spirit-controlled life, a spirit-filled life, um, a life that, as we see in ver- chapter 7, is, it's not a perfect life, it's not a sinless life, uh, to be sure, the Apostle Paul struggled with sin, and if he did, I know I'm going to, and I know you will as well. Uh, so it's not a sinless life, but it is a life where by God's Spirit, and this is kind of the way I put it, and I, I, hope, it's, uh, I hope it's okay to think of it this way, I think we move into growing dimensions of victory uh, in our lives. In other words, you know, the old preacher said, uh, I'm no, I know I'm not uh, what I ought to be, uh, but I'm certainly not what I was. And I, I really hope by God's grace um, that I'm going to be, you know, what he wants me to be. And, of course, we will uh, ultimately realize that uh, through the power of his spirit as reflected in, in chapter 8. And, of course, chapter 8 is, is uh, our new power in the Spirit. We've got a new position in Christ. We have a new problem in the flesh. And that problem, of course, is um, when before you become a Christian, uh, you know, you don't have as heightened a sense of sin. If, um, if you still have a conscience that, you know, is in pretty good shape, you're still bearing the image and likeness of God pretty good, then maybe your conscience troubles you and stuff, but not to the, not to the extent that the Spirit uh, will, will do that. And, and so now you just sense an internal warfare that you didn't sense before, and uh, it kind of creates a, a whole different dimension in your life. But God gives us His Holy Spirit, and uh, chapter 8 talks about that, how that... Uh, you know, if, if uh, we belong to Christ, if we're in the body of Christ, then we have his spirit. And that spirit, uh, you know, as Christ mentioned in John uh, chapter uh, 16, is going to convict of sin. He's going to it's gonna bother us when we sin. But uh, the spirit comes alongside and helps us as well. And, and of course, uh, uh, Paul tells us here in, in Romans 8 that, uh, the Spirit really helps us to pray. Uh, we all bear burdens that we feel are just too much uh, for us at times, and it, it's the Spirit that, that comes in and, and intercedes and prays for us, and the Spirit ultimately will help us, uh, usher us into God's presence, and, uh, and when that occurs, the groaning of this world stops, as he mentions in uh, chapter 8, and that spirit seals our, our salvation in such a way that uh, nothing can separate us uh, from God and his love. Uh, Romans uh, 9 through 11 really address the sovereignty of God. Uh, these, are, these are hard passages uh, in talking about God's sovereignty. And, uh, you know, you need to, if, as you read through these passages, you'll need to pray for grace and, and wisdom uh, as you do so, uh, really trying to grasp the mind of God. But uh, here we have Israel's past election. That's the only way to understand it, how God uh, in his sovereignty would choose a small group of people in the heart of the Middle East uh, surrounded by enemies that far, far, far outnumber them and how you'd have one monotheistic, God-honoring group in the middle of, of uh, a polytheistic, uh, uh, God-denying group, and, uh, and to see God's hand. And, and, and that, 
Uh, but just as an aside, that's a tremendous apologetic. It's a tremendous uh, reason for you feeling that your faith is genuine. Just the history of Israel uh, is huge. But then we see Israel's uh, rejection of the Savior, as he describes in uh, chapter 10. Uh, but there is a future for Israel uh, in verse 11. And of course, that becomes a, a major differing point uh, between uh, uh, what's oftentimes called dispensational theology and covenantal theology. And the, at the heart of those differences basically is a view of Israel's future. And so uh, covenant theologians uh, would downplay uh, Israel's future redemption. And, and by downplay, I mean they would see it as just a spiritual in terms of God choosing uh, Jewish people uh, for himself. Uh, others, uh, dispensationalists, would say, no, uh, Israel's future redemption includes Israel going back to the land and uh, many of the Old Testament prophecies uh, being fulfilled more completely um, in the future. Chapter 12, verse 1, then, um, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Through chapter 15 and verse 13 uh, is righteousness practiced. And uh, so chapter 12 uh, begins to describe what uh, consecration or total commitment to God looks like. Uh, chapter 13, probably the, the primary takeaway there is subjection to authority. There are some other things there as well. And then uh, chapters 14 through um, about the middle part of chapter 15 would be uh, the weaker brother, consideration for those who are weaker uh, in the faith. And then uh, the conclusion uh, is the remainder of chapter 15 through chapter 16, uh, Paul reminds them of his faithfulness to the ministry, and um, he talks about his future uh, with them and uh, greets his friends, and then there's a, just a tremendous benediction uh, that closes the book as uh, he prays for all the good things um, that uh, believers can uh, experience to be part of their life uh, as well. Now, if you were to back up and I could have approached this uh, as we went through this, just to think of some key verses. But uh, quite frankly, uh, you know, the guy who gets the greatest benefit, or I should say the person who gets the greatest benefit out of teaching the Word is the teacher. Uh, we come away uh, just tremendously blessed by God and also tremendously convicted uh, by God as well. But uh, I just enjoyed reading through the book as I thought about uh, sharing this with you folks. And as I did so, I just, I just picked out some key verses. And uh, I thought maybe I'd kind of share those with you, and I'm going to try not to comment on them too much because uh, I don't have much more than about 10 minutes left here. But, uh, of course, I mentioned chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God. And then the close of verse uh, 17 in chapter 1, but the righteous uh, shall, the man shall live by faith, or the just shall live by faith. Uh, and then he begins to talk about depravity in uh, verse 20 of chapter 1, uh, for since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what is made so that they are without excuse. So he basically pulls the rug out from under excusability here, and he says, you know, people see enough in creation to know that there's some kind of creator. They see enough design to know there's a designer. And uh, although that is not enough to know that uh, salvation has been made uh, available, uh, that would be what we call natural revelation. People can look at natural revelation and say, wow, something's got to be behind that. But they need special revelation in order to find the way of salvation. But the fact is, is natural revelation should stimulate a curiosity towards seeking 
in getting special revelation. And uh, if you have a chance sometime, uh, maybe uh, Paul Little, for instance, would be one guy. You take a look at some of his work and see how that people who didn't have any special revelation began to seek God uh, because they saw him in natural revelation and then God revealed himself uh, to them. It's really cool. Well, if you fast forward to chapter 3 and verse 10, um, you see, For as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. And so the, the Apostle Paul says there that uh, no one is righteous uh, before God. In verse 23, um, he reiterates that and he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so um, he's laying the groundwork in, be, in between all of these uh, that basically outline the depravity of, uh, of man. He'll state that even uh, more directly in Ephesians where he says, you know, we were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead people don't even, have, don't even know they're dead uh, until they're, they're made alive or they're quickened. In chapter 4 and verse 5, he says, uh, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. And these were the kind of things that really began to change Martin Luther's thinking as he looked at the book. And he, he saw that, you know, salvation isn't based on works. There's not enough that we could ever do uh, to earn God's favor. But instead, salvation is the gift of God. And we accept that through faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we turn to him and, and we put ourselves completely and, and wholly uh, upon him. In chapter 5 and verse 1, uh, starting this pivotal uh, turn here, he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, and so now he's talking about those who have accepted that gift of God. He says, we have peace with God uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, there's two kinds of peace that Paul is going to mention in his writing. And here it's peace with God. So uh, prior to knowing Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we're described as enemies of God. And now peace has been made. And uh, that peace then will take us to the next uh, level where he'll even call us the children of God, uh, a child with such a close relationship to the Father that he'll say, we can say, Abba, Father. And when my wife and I uh, lived on a kibbutz in Israel, we'd hear the little babies say, Abba, Abba. Um, and I was reminded of that passage, how that we can say, Abba, uh, Father. And then in verse 8, he says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, uh, Christ died for us. So this is uh, the beginning of, of what the Puritans would call the doctrines of grace, that uh, it's the grace of God that reaches out to us, and, and uh, it's his love that initiates this. It's, it's the death of his son that makes it possible. It's all of God and his work. And then in, uh, chapter, in chapter 6 and uh, verse 11, uh, he says, Even so consider, or we would say reckon, yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. And in verse 12, he says, Don't let sin reign uh, in your mortal body. Uh, so in uh, chapter 6 here, he's He's uh, encouraging us to begin to live in a, in a victorious way, um, to, to live in a way that, that demonstrates victory over sin, or stated even better, death uh, to the flesh and death to sin, but alive to the goodness of God and uh, waiting on God uh, for that. Another uh, key verse in chapter 6 and verse 23 for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so uh, we see here, you know, that um, in this verse that, that we're free from sin, and because we're free from sin, we're free from the death uh, that sin causes. 
and God's gift uh, results in, in eternal life. In chapter 7, uh, a key verse, he says, in uh, verse 24 of chapter 7, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? And uh, the answer to the question is, uh, Jesus uh, sets us free, and he sets us free from through the power of his spirit. Uh, I think probably if if there were a pinnacle, uh, if if you kind of viewed the book of Romans as a sort of a collection of peaks, every chapter is a peak, the highest peak in the book, uh, in my humble opinion, would be chapter 8. Uh, chapter 8 is just an amazing, amazing uh, chapter full of teaching and promises and and assurances, you know, that we have. Um, you know, in, in, cha in verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so here we have that two-word definition uh, for what it means to be a believer in Christ. And since we're in Christ, uh, we escape condemnation. And verse 8 says, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So anything I do in my own way, in my own time, uh, isn't going to be pleasing to God. It's the flesh. Instead, as, as I learn uh, as a believer to walk in the Spirit, to allow the Spirit to control me and, and to God to live through me and for God to live through me, it's then, you know, that I, that I begin to please him, uh, you see. And, of course, uh, who hasn't been comforted by Romans 8.28? Uh, and that is, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according uh, to his purpose. And I, I know that that verse has uh, probably comforted your heart as much or more as it has mine as, as I've ridden on this roller coaster called life. And uh, just to know that God's hand is in these things. And then uh, the comfort just continues to build in the passage because verses like verses 38 and 39, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us uh, from the love of God. Wow, those are, those are amazing passages, and, and you can't think on them too much. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in uh, chapters 9 through 11 with you. Uh, I will say this, that um, those chapters are meat, they're not milk, as is most of Romans. But uh, when you go into those passages, uh, know this, that um, those passages very clearly and very directly teach the sovereignty of God. And it's not for the faint of heart. If you're going to hold to the sovereignty of God, if you're going to be okay with the sovereignty of God... You've got to believe in your heart of hearts that God is good and he knows what he's doing, okay? And uh, that we're created and, and we don't really know what we're doing. And, and when you think of the potter and the clay, um, you have to really get the, you know, the right relationship there of who's the potter and who's the clay. And, of course, when you move to Romans chapter 12, um, he talks about being a living sacrifice and the implications for that uh, in, in terms of living with each other and putting myself on the back burner and instead seeing my life as an offering and the relationship to government in Romans uh, 13. In Romans 14, uh, you're going to see uh, that we are to prefer weaker brothers and sisters and by prefer, I mean act in deference to them. Uh, there may be things that you and I want to do, but we choose not to do it uh, because, uh, and, and we feel completely free to do it, but we choose not to do it because we wouldn't offend anyone for the world. 
And then uh, as we look at uh, chapter 15, uh, that idea continues of the weaker always acting in preference to the stronger, and then all the closings that occur in chapter 16. And uh, let me read the closing of chapter 16 to you um, as a prayer and, uh, and, and as my uh, heart's desire for you as we uh, just finish up this hour that's gone very quickly. Um, it says, Now to him who is able to establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Uh, thanks for spending uh, an hour with me. Uh, I know, you know, we've covered tons of stuff in a short period of time. I pray that uh, maybe we'll be able to think through it a little more and go back over these things, and the Spirit of God will continue to seal the truth of God more to our hearts. Uh, blessings on you, uh, brothers and sisters at Crossroads. Bye for now.